Welcome to History Made. In this video, let's embark on a journey to explore the mysteries of crystal skulls. Crystal skulls are not uncommon or terribly mysterious. Thousands are produced every year in Brazil, China, and Germany. But there are a handful of these rather macabre objects that have fueled intense interest and controversy among archaeologists, scientists, spiritualists, and museum officials for more than a century. In the late 19th century, a mysterious ensemble of carved crystal skulls emerged, each one claiming a connection to ancient Mesoamerican civilizations – Aztec, Toltec, Mixtec, or Maya. Since then, these crystal skulls have ignited a storm of intrigue fueled by believers attributing supernatural powers and ancient origins, while skeptics question the authenticity of their provenance. There are perhaps a dozen of these rare crystal skulls in private and public collections. Some are crystal clear, others of smoky or colored quartz. Some are actual human size and of very fine detail, while others are smaller and less refined. All are believed to originate from Mexico and Central America. Many believe these skulls were carved thousands or even tens of thousands of years ago by an ancient Mesoamerican civilization. Others think they may be relics from the legendary island of Atlantis or proof that extraterrestrials visited the Aztec sometime before the Spanish conquest. However, despite the Hollywood theatrics and online hype, not a single crystal skull has ever been pulled from an excavation site. And yet the real story of crystal skulls is nonetheless filled with intrigue, mystery, and questions. Were the crystal skulls handmade by ancient Aztecs? Are they the work of supernatural powers? Or are they carefully crafted fakes? Why would so much work and time be spent on perfecting a human skull made out of one of the hardest substances known to man after diamonds, rock crystal? The cutting of which requires great expertise and precision and the carving and polishing of which is equally time consuming. Why a skull? To find answers to these questions, let's dive deeper into the fascinating history of crystal skulls and understand what makes them so mystifying. The authenticity of archaeological artifacts is a cornerstone in unraveling the mysteries of our past. Skulls feature prominently in Aztec iconography and are often found carved into the walls of ancient temples or on depictions of deities. However, no crystal skull has ever been documented at any archaeological dig in Mexico or elsewhere, and none of the examples in museum collections can actually be traced back to an excavation project. Having said that, countless representations of skulls have been found at Aztec sites. Also, in Mesoamerican artwork, skulls are featured prominently in a variety of settings, such as Aztec monoliths made from volcanic rock or the skull masks of obsidian, cabochon, and jade. Stylistically, these pre-Columbian relics are usually quite different from the crystal skulls, all of which makes it rather unlikely that the Aztecs actually produced the famous bonses. In major museum collections around the world, we can find masterfully carved and haunting crystal skulls in all manner of styles and sizes. The smallest is a simple amulet, while the largest is bigger than a bowling ball. And for generations, museum visitors have been captivated by their allure. By 1990s, archaeologists were beginning to suspect that most, if not all, of the Aztec crystal skulls were fake. Hard proof eventually came in 1992. A heavy package addressed to the non-existent Smithsonian Institute Curator, Mesoamerican Museum, Washington, D.C., was delivered to the National Museum of American History. It was accompanied by an unsigned letter stating, this Aztec crystal skull purported to be part of the Porfirio Diaz collection, was purchased in Mexico in 1960. I am offering it to the Smithsonian without consideration. The skull was handed over to an anthropologist named Jane McLaren Walsh at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History to look after. She knew about the skull's history as popular museum attractions, and Walsh was also aware of their dubious side, having exhibited a skull in a museum exhibit that labeled it a fake. As she examined the new arrival, she spotted a handful of reasons to doubt it was a genuine artifact. And as she eventually started digging into the backstories of other crystal skulls, she saw a trend of clear red flags and a strange pattern of similarities. Walsh started by examining the origins of a two-inch crystal skull in a Smithsonian Institution collection. 
It had appeared seemingly out of nowhere in the late 1800s as part of a collection that came to the museum from Mexico. And in a catalog card, she found an analysis done by a geologist named William Foshag, an expert in Mesoamerican carved stones. Foshag's investigation revealed that the object was definitely a fake, created with modern jewelry making tools and techniques. In a trove of documents that accompanied the larger collection of artifacts, she also stumbled onto a potential suspect involved, a man named Eugène Bobin. Bobin's name would eventually appear throughout the investigation. The further exploration revealed that the first Mexican crystal skulls made their debut just before the 1863 French intervention, when Louis Napoleon's army invaded Mexico and installed Maximilian von Habsburg of Austria as emperor. The crystal skulls surfaced then are small, not taller than 1.5 inches. The earliest specimen seems to be a British Museum crystal skull about an inch high. Two other examples were exhibited in 1867 at the Exposition Universelle in Paris as part of the collection of Eugène Bobin, perhaps the most mysterious figure in the history of the crystal skulls. The exhibition was not entirely successful in showcasing Louis Napoleon's second empire, since its opening coincided with the execution of Maximilian by the forces of Mexican President Benito Juarez. One small crystal skull was purchased in 1874 for 28 pesos by Mexico City's National Museum from the Mexican collector Luis Costantino, and another for 30 pesos in 1880. In 1886, the Smithsonian bought a small crystal skull, this one from the collection of Augustin Fisher, who had been Emperor Maximilian's secretary in Mexico. But it disappeared mysteriously from the collection sometime after 1973. It had been on display in an exhibit of archaeological fakes after William Fushag realized in the 1950s that it had been carved with a modern lapidary wheel. Again and again, Walsh's investigation seemed to trace the story of the crystal skulls back to a specific time frame, from the 1860s to the 1890s, and a single man, Bobin. Bobin, a Frenchman born in 1834, was enthralled by Mexico and its history. He traveled there extensively, and over the years, he eventually became an archaeologist working for a member of the French Scientific Commission in Mexico. Bobon developed friendships with many of the greatest archaeologists of his day and took great interest in collecting artifacts from across the region. Through catalogs and exhibitions, he sold artifacts to collectors and museums in the late 19th century. Around the same time, Experts had started noticing fake Aztec and pre-Columbian artifacts flooding museum collections. An 1886 article in the journal Science decried the trade in spurious Mexican antiquities. The museums themselves weren't ignorant about fakes, but they also didn't know enough to avoid them. So increasingly, they started turning to subject experts for help. That's how Boban got his start. As Boban built a reputation as an expert in Mexican antiquities, museum curators trusted him to arrange deals. They couldn't have realized that he was selling them forgeries or that he had invented crystal skulls because they didn't know Aztec society well enough. Boban banked on that, and he managed to hide the skull's origins through fake purchase histories. A second-generation skull, life-size and without a vertical hole, first appeared in 1881 in the Paris shop of none other than Boban, this skull is just under six inches high. The description in the catalog he published provided no fine spot for the object, and it is listed separately from his Mexican antiquities. Boban called it a masterpiece of lapidary technology and noted that it was unique in the world. Despite being one of a kind, the skull failed to sell. So when Boban returned to Mexico City in 1885, he took it with him. He exhibited it alongside a collection of actual human skulls in his shop, which he dubbed the Museo Scientifico. According to local gossip, Boban tried to sell it to Mexico's National Museum as an Aztec artifact, in partnership with Leopoldo Batres, whose official government title was protector of pre-Hispanic monuments. But the museum's curator assumed the skull was a glass fake and refused to purchase it. Then Batres denounced Boban as a fraud and accused him of smuggling antiquities. In July 1886, Boban moved his museum business and collection to New York City and later held an auction of several thousand archaeological artifacts 
colonial Mexican manuscripts, and a large library of books. Tiffany and company bought the crystal skull at this auction for $950. A decade later, Tiffany sold it to the British Museum for the original purchase price. Interestingly, Boban's 1886 catalog for the New York auction lists yet another crystal skull. Of the smaller variety, it is described as being from the Valley of Mexico and is listed with a crystal hand, which is described as Aztec. Neither of these objects can now be accounted for. A third generation of skulls appeared sometime before 1934, when Sidney Burney, a London art dealer, purchased a crystal skull of proportions almost identical to the specimen the British Museum bought from Tiffany's. There is no information about where he got it, but it is very nearly a replica of the British Museum skull, almost exactly the same shape, but with more detailed modeling of the eyes and the teeth. It also has a separate mandible, which puts it in a class by itself. In 1943, it was sold at Sotheby's in London to Frederick Arthur Mitchell Hedges, a well-to-do English deep-sea fisherman, explorer, and yarn spinner extraordinaire. It became apparent that not only had the dealer, Eugène Bobon, owned the British Museum skull, he had previously also been involved in the sale of three other rock crystal skulls, one 11 centimeter high and two small ones, less than five centimeter high, which are currently in the Musée du Quai Branly, Paris. After gathering all this information, Jane Walsh then teamed up with Margaret Sachs from the British Museum to analyze both the Smithsonian skull and the specimen housed in London. Using scanning electron microscopy, they found that both skulls were carved with rotary wheels and could therefore not have been produced using Aztec technology. The Smithsonian skull, it turned out, had even been finished with a synthetic abrasive called carborundum, which wasn't invented until relatively recently. Walsh and Sachs then analyzed the fluid and solid incursions in the quartz from which the skulls were made, determining that the rock was forged in a mesothermal metamorphic environment. This ruled out Central America as a source and indicated that the crystal most likely came from either Brazil or Madagascar, neither of which appeared on Aztec trading routes. Ultimately, Walsh and Sachs concluded that neither skull was pre-Columbian in origin, and that both were probably manufactured less than a decade before they were purchased. Walsh and Sachs's joint research was published in the Journal of Archaeological Science, actually made the skulls then. In many cases, Walsh suspects Boban may have acquired them from aging Christian churches in Mexico that the government was tearing down. We may never know. But Boban himself also seemed to tip off future generations to his complicity in the Crystal Skull Saga when he talked to a newspaper journalist in the year 1900. Boban said, Numbers of so-called rock crystal, pre-Columbian skulls have been so adroitly made as almost to defy detection and have been palmed off as genuine upon the experts of some of the principal museums of Europe. Meanwhile, real archaeological artifacts were also streaming out of Mexico. Excavations were uncovering new clues about the Aztec, a civilization that was just as advanced as its contemporaries in Europe, and museums and private collectors around the world were eager to get a piece of it. Curators were snatching up objects that seemed rare and exotic. Ancient crystal skulls would have seemed like the perfect get. Centuries ago, Aztec spiritual beliefs and ceremonies placed major significance on the human skull. They carved ornate skulls into stone and depicted their gods wearing human skulls as jewelry. When the Aztecs sacrificed humans, they'd rip out people's hearts and put their heads on stakes. In fact, between 2015 and 2017, Archaeologists dug up a monumental Aztec tower at Templo Mayor in Mexico City that's some 20 feet in diameter and was built from more than 650 human skulls. The discovery of this skull tower belies the staggering scale of human sacrifice happening in what was then the Aztec capital city. It also shows just how obsessed their culture was with the skull. It wasn't just the Aztecs either. Going further back into history, the Maya and the Olmecs before them also used skulls in their spiritual practices and their art. When you combine the pre-Columbian fascination with skulls with the technical prowess at carving stone, it becomes easy to believe that these ancient people could have carved skulls out of crystal. And for nearly 150 years,
That subtext helped a number of museum exhibit curators feel comfortable about displaying their newly acquired archaeological artifacts, despite long-standing questions about the Crystal Skull's true origins. Since Boban showed the way, few others also jumped into the fake skull trade, and they continue to turn up backed by histories plausible enough to fool many. A lot of such sellers have gone beyond the skull swindle, and museum curators around the world now lose sleep, wondering if some of their prized exhibits are also bogus. Jane Walsh is frequently called in to authenticate items and often has to pass on the bad news that a treasured antique is, in fact, a forgery. Among the crystal skulls, one stands out as the most infamous, the Mitchell Hedges skull. Unveiling a tale of mystery, controversy, and a legacy that continues to captivate the imagination. The saga begins in 1924 when Anna Mitchell Hedges, on an expedition with her adoptive father Frederick Mitchell Hedges, to Belize, stumbled upon the ruins of Lubantan, an ancient Maya city. After burning 33 hectares of thick forestation, the area revealed a huge stone pyramid, walls of a city and an amphitheater, which could seat thousands of spectators. The site was called Lubantun, or the Place of the Fallen Stones. The story goes that when Mitchell Hedges returned to the site after three years, his daughter Anna Mitchell was with him. Amidst the exploration, a beam of light revealed an object inside an abandoned pyramid. On her 17th birthday, lowered into the pyramid by rope, Anna emerged with the legendary crystal skull. Crafted from transparent quartz, the Mitchell Hedges skull measures about 8 inches long, 5 inches wide, and 5 inches high, weighing around 12 pounds. However, Mitchell Hedges made no mention of the find until 1956. In his book, Danger My Ally, he claimed that the crystal skull dated back at least 3,600 years and taking about 150 years to rub down with sand from a block of pure rock crystal is in his possession, but strangely omitted Anna's role in its discovery. He called the skull the Skull of Doom. He built an elaborate mythology around the artifact, claiming it possessed the ability to kill those who mocked it. On the other hand, the skull was also said to have great healing powers. Frederick Mitchell Hedges died in 1959, and his daughter Anna took the skull on tour. She regaled interviewers and audiences with the story of how she found the skull underneath an altar in a ruined temple. She engaged the services of art restorer Frank Dorland, who said he heard choral music and bells emanating from the skull. The dawn of the New Age movement, with its focus on the curative power of crystals, brought renewed interest to the Skull of Doom. Anna retired from touring with the skull and moved to the United States. However, she continued to give interviews about the skull and continued to uphold claims of the skull's discovery and magical properties. Anna claimed that the Maya associated the skull with the ability to will death and transfer knowledge during ceremonies. However, doubt shrouds the Mitchell Hedges narrative. In 1936, a British journal named art dealer Sidney Burney as the skull's owner. Anna explained that her father left it in Burney's care, who auctioned it in 1943. Mitchell Hedges allegedly paid a hefty sum to reclaim it at Sotheby's. The story was later refuted as it came to light that Anna had not accompanied her father on that expedition, but that Mitchell Hedges had bought the skull at an auction held by Sotheby's in London. Details surrounding the skull's ownership and origin remain contentious, and skepticism intensified when the British Museum and the Smithsonian conducted analyses in the 21st century. However, Anna stuck to her story till she died at the age of 100 in 2007. Anna claimed that she had several dreams regarding ceremonies and rituals performed by the ancient Mayans whenever the skull was in her bedroom at night. The skull is said to emit blue lights from its eyes and has reputedly crashed computer hard drives. Anna claimed that the skull could cause visions and cure cancer, and that in another instance, she saw in it a premonition of the John F. Kennedy assassination. She also gave the skull for scientific examination to Hewlett Packard. The findings were quite puzzling. The skull had been carved with diamonds and then smoothened with a solution made out of silicon sand and water. 
but the strangest part was that the entire workings were done against the axis of the crystal. This means that whenever a piece of crystal or quartz is cut, it has to be done according to the axis formed by the molecular structure of the rock. Going against it would shatter the entire piece. So how was this done in the first place? However, Hewlett-Packard has no record of these tests. Since 2007, the Mitchell Hedges skull is in the possession of her widower, Bill Homan, but 10 nieces and nephews have also laid claim to it. Bill Homan continues to believe in its mystical properties. The Mitchell Hedges skull's journey takes a legal turn as archaeologist Jaime Awe files a lawsuit on behalf of Belize, alleging the removal of the alleged artifact from the country violated its laws. The lawsuit aims to preserve Belize's cultural heritage and raise awareness of the nation's commitment to safeguarding its cultural artifacts. As the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull remains entwined in controversy, its extraordinary origins persist in evading explanation. The Mitchell Hedges skull is arguably the most famous crystal skull, but people have discovered several others. Most of them do not have the same storied history as the Mitchell Hedges skull, but each is still unique. The Mayan and the Amethyst skull were brought to the United States by a Mayan priest. They were claimed to be found in Guatemala and Mexico. They were both tested and were found to have also been cut against the axis of the rocks. Then we have Max, the Texas skull, which was in the possession of a Tibetan healer, Norbu Chen, who gave it to Carl and Joe Parks against a debt. It was only after Joe found out that the skull was of archaeological interest worldwide that she took it out of her closet and had it examined by an expert. It was indeed found to be ancient. Another crystal skull enthusiast, Joke Van Dieten Masland, has a smoky quartz crystal skull, which was claimed to be discovered in 1906 during the excavation of a Mayan temple in Guatemala. Joke states that the skull has healing powers and helped heal a brain tumor in a book she has written titled Messengers of Ancient Wisdom. The skull is named E.T. because it has a pointed head and an exaggerated jaw with an overbite, which makes it look like it an alien-shaped head and is said to have arrived from the Pleiades star cluster 444 light years away. Ms. Van Dieten totes E.T. around the world to demonstrate its ability to cure ailments. The Aztec skull that is at the Museum of Man in London has been said to move on its own inside its glass case and museum staff seem uncomfortable around it. Isha Nara is a crystal quartz skull discovered in Mexico in 1995 through the application of psychic archaeology. Like its colleagues, it is claimed to possess amazing occult powers. Its current custodian is Michelle Nocerino of Portland, Oregon. Though the British Museum exhibits its skulls as examples of fakes, Others still offer them up as the genuine article. Mexico's National Museum, for example, identifies its skulls as the work of Aztec and Mixtec artisans. Perhaps it is because, like the Indiana Jones movies, these macabre objects are reliable crowd-pleasers. Impressed by their technical excellence and gleaming polish, generations of museum curators and private collectors have been taken in by these objects. But they are too good to be true. If we consider that pre-Columbian lapidaries used stone, bone, wooden, and possibly copper tools with abrasive sand to carve stone, crystal skulls are much too perfectly carved and highly polished to be believed. Some crystal skull devotees point to the piezoelectric properties of quartz crystal as evidence of the skull's power. They say that the skulls might function like large computer chips that have recorded the history of the Earth or even messages from aliens or lost civilizations. We just have to discover the right way to read them. According to believers in the supernatural and the occult, crystal skulls are more than just interesting artifacts. They may represent doom and destruction, or hope and healing. Some people think that you can use crystal skulls like crystal balls to see visions of the past, present, and future. They claim that the skulls emit psychic energy, auras, or even sounds. Believers point to Maya creation myths that reference crystal skulls and a story that the Maya scattered 13 crystal skulls thousands of years ago in hopes that people would discover and reunite them in modern times. There is a passion on both sides of the issue, and the fact remains that no one knows for sure who made these skulls and when. 
And since there is currently no way to accurately determine the age of such inorganic objects, the mystery will likely continue. Ultimately, the truth behind the skulls may have gone to the grave with Boban, who managed to confound a great many people for a very long time and has left an intriguing legacy, one that continues to puzzle us a century after his death. Are these skulls really the ancient showcases of human wisdom and hold powerful knowledge or as scientists say, just clever fakes? One thing is clear, that a fake is a replica of the original. And whoever made these bafflingly mysterious crystal skulls and for whatever purpose, has left a big question. The answer to which is really not crystal clear. In the ever-evolving narrative of our archaeological understanding, the pursuit of truth remains an unwavering guide. As the debate rages on, the crystal skulls remain an enigma, suspended between belief and skepticism. The mystery endures, and the crystal skulls continue to captivate minds, prompting us to question the thin veil separating history from fiction.